Hey, Lou, sorry, sorry for being late. That's all right. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. Okay. So, thank you for coming on. And, and you prefer Lou, is that right? Um, yeah, you can call me Lou or Poo or Pooper Noodle. Yeah, so what's up, with, what's up with that, by the way? What, um, why is your... What? Why is your name Pooper Noodle? Uh, okay, I would not think we'd do this already. Oh, um, no, I mean, we don't have to. I was just, sorry. <laughs> is that something I'm not supposed to ask no. you about? No, no, no. I, I can, I can, I can say. Um, no, it's, it's just kind of like it's an odd name, no? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. It's a bit weird. Um, basically, uh, the second time I went to university, I was, as the title suggests, very socially anxious. Um, I, I used to, I had a sink in my room, uh, and I used to, I used to pee in the in the sink because I, I was avoiding my flatmates. Um, well, I mean, it started off okay, like. Freshers week was okay, but then I didn't. I ended up staying in my room on my computer for like a week, and then like I hadn't seen them in a week, and I was like, okay, it's been a week. Like if I see them now, it's going to be really weird. So then it like the weeks turned into months. Anyway, um, no, so I, yeah. I didn't. I, I didn't go into the kitchen ever, and I didn't use the bathroom. I used to pee in my sink in my room, and I used to make food in my room as well. Occasionally, I would make noodles in the sink and in the uk there's this brand called super noodles um anyway uh but um i didn't yeah i one time i one time i i, I defecated in the sink by accident um it, yeah i didn't it, it wasn't on purpose normally i would um normally i would sh shit in like um Wait, can I swear? Oh, it's too late now. Um, normally, I'd shit in like plastic bags. Okay. Um, yeah. Accidents. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, that's what happened. And hmm. then the guy I was that who was my boyfriend at the time, he made a joke, called me poop and noodle because it was the same sink that I made noodles <laughs> in, and it rhyme was super noodle. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, it's. I think it's funny. I, I I also think it's interesting that you, you know, this is not the kind of thing that people would normally advertise. No. No, not really. <laughs> so help me understand that. I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I I very openly used to talk about this a lot and like make like sort of raunchy gaudy sort of jokes and stuff and talk about that sort of thing um i i think i felt like sort of wearing it on my sleeve helps does that, does that make sense interesting right so let's let's just put a pin in that concept right because i can okay. imagine that if we're dealing with social anxiety you know, telling the story that you just did, I would, I would imagine, makes your social anxiety worse. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. But does it? I don't know. I don't think so. I think interesting. If right? I w actually no, because I'm saying it to you and I can see your face. Yeah, that's hard. That's really hard. But saying it to like my stream when it's just a bunch of text completely different what makes it hard when you can see my face um i don't i don't know just like your your face oh no <laughs> your <laughs> not my face no i don't like it <laughs> um i just i feel like i i pay a lot of attention to yep expressions yes and you do i i know that i misinterpret expressions a lot as negative 
and I, I don't like looking at people's faces. Well, I don't like yeah. looking at your face either. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're, we'll talk about that. So paying attention to people's expressions, right? Yeah. And misinterpreting people's expressions. I don't think that you're misinterpreting yeah. them, by the way, technically. Okay. I think okay. what you're able to do is detect dissatisfaction in a face that primarily is satisfied, if that makes sense. So there's actually research on this. So let me, oh. let me explain it from the top. It's a really okay. interesting study. So I'm smiling at you, right? And then I get okay. ma mad at you. Like there's a transition. So smiling, mad. And there's like a transition, right? You, does that make sense? Like, this and then this is kind of halfway and then like this is yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a transition. So if you think about it, halfway between smiling and being mad at you, my face is displaying 50% happiness, 50% anger. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. So a normal person, and I don't mean to say you're abnormal. I mean someone who's not as sensitive as you are. Like literally your brain has a higher processing power here, okay? So, okay. so most people, their processing power, when they, when they see like the half angry, half happy face, they, they're just confused. They think, I don't know what this person is feeling. Does that make sense? Because it's like half yeah. smiling, half angry. It's like, what is that person feeling? I don't know. And even if you think about it, when I'm 80% smiling and 20% angry, most people will think that I'm happy. Does that make sense? Yeah. But people who have social anxiety or some other, I mean, it's not even a psychiatric thing, um, but like there's some other diagnoses that are associated with the ability to detect negative affect or negative emotion in someone's face, even though it's hidden. So you'll be able to detect the 20% anger with the 80% smile and your brain will tell you, oh, that person is still 20% angry. Does that make sense? So it's it's not that you that you're like you're detecting false things. You're just detecting a small amount of dissatisfaction in spite of the large amount of approval. And your yeah. brain is cluing you in to that signal. But it's not like it's in your head. It's literally that your brain is more sophisticated and can detect l low negative emotion at very low amounts. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, actually. So th the other interesting thing is that people who've experienced trauma, especially in childhood, develop this skill. So if you look oh. at people who like have abusive parents, you know, if your parents are abusive and they seem like they're in a good mood, it becomes a survival mechanism to be able to detect storm clouds. Oh, is my dad really in a good mood or is he like uh, happy on the surface and like a volcano underneath? And so like their brains literally adapt to detecting like negative emotion underneath positive emotion. Okay. It's almost like they have x-ray vision, which is kind of what you do. So the thing that you have to be careful about is that your mind will detect 20% dissatisfaction and that's what your mind will zoom in on, and it'll ignore the 80%. So that's something you have to retrain. But your capacity to detect, you're literally more sensitive. Like, you can detect things that normal human beings can't. People with anxiety and people with histories of trauma are, like, able to detect things. Because their brain has, like, told them, hey, like, this stimulus is actually important. So let's pay attention to that. What do you think about that? It made it sound much, much cooler than I thought it is. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you think about it? I don't, um, I don't know. My, I mean, my, my parents were lovely. Yep. So I, I mean, obviously there were some things that happened in my childhood, um, but I, I couldn't pinpoint like a single thing that sort of, you know, I, like I, I remember, I have memories of like my mum wearing sunglasses a lot and, Whenever she was wearing these sunglasses, I always thought she was angry at me because I, I couldn't see her face. So I always found it quite scary. Um, and so when she wore them, I'd always ask her to take them off because I couldn't, I couldn't see her face. But mm -hmm. like, I, 
I have fond memories of, of my parents. I don't. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to imply that, you know, your parents were abusive. I'm just saying that's what we see. Yes. Sometimes. No, so there's yes. two camps. There's people with social anxiety. There's also people who have a history of abuse growing up. They both, their, their brain wires to be sensitive to facial expressions. What are you getting from my face? Um, oh. You, you look a bit bored. Okay, now, oh, now you look like you're cringing. No, I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm having a blast. Okay. This is my bored face, I guess. Does this look like a bored face to you? Wait, no, it's because I'm. I was looking at the other. Because there was a little bit of a delay. Wait, do the face again. Wait, are you? You can't see me on Discord. Um, because you're like really, really pixelated. So I'm looking at your stream because you're not. You're not pixelated. Here. I'm pixelated. Yeah. That's got to be tough. Um. Oh, I can see you now. Okay, fantastic. Great. So just look at me. Don't watch stream. And certainly okay. ignore Twitch chat. I do my best to. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the random ass tangent, Lou. Okay. Oh, so. No. I... What? No, I was, I was just going to say, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. And then, so no, I think fine. there were a couple things that I really thought were really important about your story, uh, which okay. highlight so like social anxiety. So one is like this idea that they haven't seen you in a week, so you can't see them. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. two weeks go by and then it's like, no, now I can't show my face. And every week that goes by, you can't, they can't see you. And then every week oh. it gets worse and worse. And then you have to become a hermit. You have to just like move out of the apartment oh, at I'll, three I'll in the morning. See them again. That's exactly what I did. I used to, I had this huh? little pile of cushions that I would put like right next to the door so I could sit and listen for long periods of time to work out when they weren't in the corridor and I that sounds absolutely crazy doesn't it yeah um yeah yeah that's like, that's what happens I mean like what you said about the it's been the weeks and then it's been months thing like I remember one time um I was in a quite a long uh uber journey and as I got in the car my seat belt um got stuck in the door so it was like poking out the door so I sit in the car but I didn't want to move over so I was I, I couldn't I, I couldn't actually use the seat belt um but it had been about 20 seconds by that point and I felt like oh no if I if I say something about it now to him and ask the, the door, I'm gonna yep. look like a twat so so I ended up just sat there for the next like 20 yep. minutes thinking that I was gonna die because I wasn't wearing a seat belt because I felt too nervous to actually say hey can I yeah yeah and then it's like, how do you tell them, oh, like five minutes into the journey, like, oh, by the way, I don't have a seatbelt on. <laughs> 10 minutes into the journey, by the way, I don't have a seatbelt on. Exactly. And then they're like, why would, why would you wait 10 minutes and then tell me? You know? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I, I remember one time I had, I'd been out of school for a little while. And then like, since I was out of school, like I couldn't go back. Like, what would people think? Yes. And then, like, I had missed classes. And then, like, how can you show up? Like, I, I had just been skipping class. I was playing video games all day. And then it was, like, halfway through the semester. If I start going to class now, I can still pass. But can you just, like, I didn't know, like, what to think. Like, there are 30 people in the class, and then halfway through the semester, someone just walks in that you've never seen before. Yes, yes, And then exactly. they're like, what are you doing here? And you're like, I'm in the class. And they're like, no, you're not. Where have you been this whole time? I couldn't do it. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, not, yeah, I, I dropped out of university a few years ago because of I just which, failed largely because of that. Yeah. Oh, right. So I showed yeah. up on the day of my final, and then I I put my head down and I I thought I was banking on people not noticing because they would be taking their final. Yeah. And then took my final and then walked out. Do you know what grade I got in the class? Can you guess? Uh, I don't how do you grade things oh yeah where you are? <laughs> so A, B, C, D and F okay um, how do you grade things where you are 
that way, but I don't know. I just thought <laughs> it might be different. A, 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 a C. F. Wait, no, you said you. Oh, okay. You got yeah. an F. Yeah. That's how you fail a class, boys and girls. So you never go, and then you show up on the final, and then you do your best, which is pretty awful. And then I went home yeah. and I played a lot of Diablo 2 to make my feelings oh. go away. That sounds fun, though. It was actually a lot of fun. It was a blast of a semester. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Alas. Hmm. Okay. I, I did actually have a class that I failed as well because of that. But that was at this university. Hmm. Uh, it was, it was, um, I was studying Chinese and I, I went, I went for like the first couple months and then it dropped off. I have this pattern with everything that I do. It just, it slowly drops off because mm. I miss one thing and then I'm like, well, I can't go to the next one because yep. I wasn't at the last one. And what if they ask me what happened at the last one? I wasn't there. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the days turn into weeks, turn into months. I, I go to the final exam um, and I throw up <laughs> in the room <laughs> and I get sent home and I failed the exam. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's hard, right? Like when, when the only way that you can show up the next day is to have been perfect the day, the day before. Yes. I hadn't thought of it like that. Yeah. Well, that's, what do you think about that? I don't, I don't know. I like to be very like prepared. Because mm -hmm. things have for... to go perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't go back. Yep. Right. So, so like, like, Lou, I think you're living life like these speedrunners, where like a single mistake and you have to start over. Yeah. Right. So you <laughs> yeah. never make, and like that's great when you're playing the same game with the same levels over and over and over and over and over again. But it's hard in life where like every day is a little bit different. It's like you're trying to yeah. speed run a game, but you only get to play it once, and tomorrow there's a new game. Yeah. It's weird. I think I understand that. Yeah, so chase and perfection. Why do you have to be prepared? Um, just prepare, you know, for the, for the worst. I, uh... I've been told I uh, catastrophize a lot. What is that? So mean? like, like oh, I don't know how to describe. Like, for example, I used to go to these like spin classes with my dad, um, and suddenly, out of nowhere, um, I would it, this thought would pop into my head that like I'm gonna spin off the front of the bike and like die. And like the bike will like explode or something or something will explode in the room above me. Um, and it happens like every time I go outside, like I'm trying to cross the road, this car is going to run me over. I, I, I'm like, I'm going to die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird to have a mind that tells you that kind of stuff, right? Does that make sense? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Cause it, it's, cause it is my mind. Mm -hmm. Does everyone not have these thoughts sometimes? Or... Do you have those thoughts? Do you not have those thoughts sometimes? Um, I suppose when I'm drunk. Ah. I don't catastrophize. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and how long have you been catastrophizing? Like forever. Okay. So you've been doing it your entire life? Oh, it feels that way, but maybe not. I think sure. so, yeah. Important revelation, right? Let's just think about that. <laughs> maybe. So, so you just said, yeah, I have been doing it. And then you paused and then you said, it feels like it's been my entire life. Yeah. So... Has it been your entire life? No. So Only let's, the past few years. So let's think about that, right? So something, when I asked you the question, there's some kind of internal calculation 
that says, yes, this has been going on forever. Like, it gave you yeah. that answer. Yeah. Like, but it turns out that that's not actually the case. So then if we're being very careful, what we have to recognize is that sometimes our mind produces answers for us that are wrong. Yeah. That's, yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Um, oh, uh, yeah, like, oh, oh, like this, this, like, just like last week, okay, um, last year there was a, a streamer who was quite, a, a, like, a big fan of, I'd been subbed to him for a few months, okay, like maybe six months, I resubscribe, and he's like, um, pooper noodle, yikes, and he's just like a bit of a joker like that's his thing whatever he farms no w's but um instantly i was like oh my god he hates me i unsubscribed instantly i unfollowed him of everywhere i just i was mortified um i avoided watching any videos about this streamer because i couldn't stop thinking about this time that he was like a pooper and it all <laughs> yikes um and like a month ago he said something really nice about me and I realized that it was just all, all in my head yeah that completely made it up mm -hmm. yeah how do you understand that what's up with that I I don't know it, it made me think of like lots of other incidents where I've just in like instantly I'm like okay this person wants nothing to do with me. I'm just going to okay. remove myself completely okay. from all of that. So let's talk about that for a second. Is that cool? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this person wants nothing to do with me. Hold on. Can I think for a second? Yes. <laughs> How much of your social anxiety can be captured by that phrase? What phrase? This person wants nothing to do with me. Um, probably quite a lot of it. Okay. How long have you felt? How long has your mind been sometimes randomly telling you that this person wants nothing to do with me? I I mean I've always been like I've always been quite quiet like uh, as a child growing up I my brother was very uh social very outgoing um and he would always make the friends and then I would like play with like little toy cars or something um and... one of us <laughs> um, yeah so that was that was that was quite difficult as well because sometimes we would do things uh, like as a family and there would be like maybe another family with like kids there and then he would make the friends first and then it, he'd be like you know oh you know don't talk to her she's just quiet and weird and then they would like all go have fun and I'd but like I, I did I liked my own company so it was it wasn't awful um I, I just wasn't very outgoing and I found it really difficult to Mm -hmm. uh, you know talk to, to to kids and stuff um and then I had some pretty oh, bad experiences in, in high school with like other girls so then I didn't know how to talk to girls anymore for, for I still don't I don't really have any friends now that are girls many at all um yeah okay so I asked you about you know sort of like whether this person wants nothing to do with me has... Oh, no! Oh, you asked me something and I went on complete tangent. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Just... <laughs> Don't be sorry. I think that's where we learn. That's wonderful. Okay. I'm glad you went on a tangent, right? Because you gave us a couple of really important pieces of information. Okay. One is that while you may have been socially isolated, the reasons for your social 
isolation back then were fundamentally different because I didn't hear this person doesn't want to hang out with me. I heard I was just kind of a quiet, shy kid and I was okay with my own company. So if anything that tells us that like something happened that changed the way that you perceived your interpersonal interactions, which is great. Like, it's great that you gave me that piece of information because then we actually know that you haven't always been like this. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, So uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I I just thought that, like, since I'd been quiet my, Uh you know, whole life that I'd always had social anxiety. But are you telling me that that's not quite the case? I could have been quiet and then something happened along the way that made me anxious about social things. That's what I would hypothesize. Okay. Right? Because what, what I'm hearing, this person wants nothing to do with me, says nothing about the person. It says something about you. Right? Yeah. It has to do with the way that you perceive your value. Whereas the girl who's content to play with toy cars has no problem with her value. In fact, as you put it, used to think the opposite. I'm a cool person to hang out with all by myself. I'm very good company. (laughs) Right? If you think about it, that's actually the exact opposite. You're like, hey, this person's awesome. I don't need any of those fuckers. I'm going to hang out with me, myself, and Lou. And we're going to play with our toy cars, and it's going to be great. Yeah. And I then somewhere I'm... somewhere along the way, you were like, oh, like, Lou's not worth hanging out with. That's different. Something's changed. Does that make sense? That those are those feel very different to me. Yes. I, um, well, like, I had, well, I had this amazing family. My childhood was a bit difficult because we were moving a lot Mm -hmm. so I was I was born in Thailand in Phuket and we lived there for six seven years and then uh, my dad was a teacher and he got a job um, then as a headmaster in Chile in South America so then we lived there for four years so I was learning different languages and then after that we we moved to to England um and while I did make friends, I was always very different from them. And there were there were times where, like, if my friends wanted to exclude me, they would they would talk in their own language so that I couldn't join in. Um, and I mean that happened in all all the countries apart from England because I could speak English then. Yeah. What was it like to be excluded? Uh, it wasn't it wasn't fun um no that there was quite a um poignant (laughs) moment in high school actually in England where I felt very excluded um that I think I don't know how to describe it, it really shaped the way I felt about myself I think um it's it sounds really materialistic but I was in this group of like maybe seven girls seven or eight girls and we were all like best friends uh but uh, there was a pecking order and I was bottom of the pecking order but it was fine because like I it meant I didn't have to sit in the toilet at lunchtime if I hung out with them um and basically every every birthday because for 18th it was his 18th birthday so every birthday everyone would pitch in 20 pounds and then like the week before everyone would would go out and choose a like a special charm bracelet with a charm for them and then like a cake and then a little surprise party and that sort of thing anyway uh you probably tell where the story's going but like four birthdays happen everyone pitches in I pitch in I guess to my birthday uh nothing really happens on the day that's fine I'm just, people are busy I wait a couple of weeks um one of the girls invites me around to hers um uh they they uh <laughs> um sorry 
um, when I walked in, there was like half a box of donuts and some deodorant that they were like spraying around. I don't know if that was like a joke, if like I smell bad or something. That's probably in my head as well. Um, but uh, these, yeah, these donuts had already started eating. Um, they sang happy birthday. I was waiting for this bracelet, um, which, uh, yeah, that makes me sound really spoiled, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, I found out afterwards that between the sort of seven of them, they only managed to get together about five, ten pounds. Um, so, well, that, that made me feel pretty shit. Um, yeah. What does that mean, feel pretty shit? What were you feeling? Um, I felt like like these these people were my f friends, and they they like I, even though I joined in all the other I joined in all the birthdays afterwards as well. Um, even though I joined in on all this stuff, they didn't they they didn't want to do the same f for me, and it. I just made me feel quite uh, excluded. Yeah. Like they want nothing to do with you? That's the one, yeah. There it is. <laughs> yeah. So I want to point something else out to you, Lou. That's uh -huh. interesting because you call yourself materialistic when you tell that story. Yeah. Why do you do that? Because it... It's, just, it's quite quite expensive bracelet. Everyone pitches in twenty pounds, but to me, it, it wasn't really about the, the bracelet. It was about. I don't think it's about the bracelet to anyone who's listening to that story. Okay. Right, but I want you to notice what your mind does, even when you're sharing something that is authentic, vulnerable, and that maybe you deserve compassion for what do you do to the try to the kind the what do you preemptively do to our compassionate response um to try try like to uh, squash yep. it yes yeah <laughs> right interesting huh you see how you're doing that you're I... actually devaluing yourself in the story you're like, look at me, I'm a materialistic little shit. And then you tell the story, which is not about, I don't think anyone thinks that that's materialistic. I think it's about fairness. And justice sounds bizarre, but like, you know, I think it's about value. It's yeah. about being valued, about being appreciated. It's not a story about material things right yeah yeah i and yet your mind generates this thought which is like oh i'm so it sounds kind of materialistic i thought we were going to talk about like you know everyone had a louis vuitton bag and like i didn't have one or something like that <laughs> even then that's okay i guess but you know that sounds to me like they they really i mean you were yeah i mean i i it doesn't sound to me like they were your friends. Oh, yeah, but I don't talk to them anymore. Cause it kept more things kept happening, and then I realized this was just making me sad. Actually, mm -hmm. um, they used to sort of say that I always make myself a victim, um, which made well, the rest of my life really hard because whenever anything happened to me, uh, I would be like, well, uh, I'm just making myself a victim here, you know? Am I overreacting? There, there it is. So, so do you see that? If you're, if you're just making yourself a victim, what are you doing to yourself? You're devaluing yourself, right? You take the oomph out of whatever complaint you have. Blaming the victim and calling someone a victim is the last refuge of assholes. Because okay. if, if you're just being a victim all the time, then like, 
I'm perfect. The problem's you. Right? It's a very, very, very easy way to dodge any kind of personal responsibility to blame the victim. Or say that, you know, Lou, what's wrong with you? You're a vic like you're so victim complex. Like we got you deodorant and donuts. And the rest of us got charm bracelets and cakes. On our birthday, by the way. Or near our birthday. Not as an afterthought. Like, why are you yeah. whining? Why are you making me feel bad for being an asshole and treating you like shit? It's your fault. Yeah, that's that sounds like what they would say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you started adopting the victim mentality, which has to do with so like if we think about it, like if 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 you start blaming yourself for being a victim, you devalue your own experience. Does that make sense? Yes. And so when you devalue yourself, like your worth as a human being in your mind decreases. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if your worth as a human being is really low, why would anyone want to hang out with you? That's true. I, I don't know why anyone would. <laughs> so so I, I think, I mean, it's kind of weird, but like this idea of this person wants nothing to do with me to me, feels very connected to this. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the the, va the value uh, thing is interesting because I don't know if this is related at all, but um, I used to get my nails done um, quite frequently before lockdown um and they, were, they always turned out okay but there was this one lady one week who just felt like she just like got a sore and was just chopping my fingers off like they were just they were bleeding and I was sat there like tears streaming like and she was like oh oh I'm sorry I hope it hurt and I, but I didn't want I didn't want her to feel bad that she was doing a bad job so I was sat there like oh no they're they're fine and then for the following few weeks, every time I went to shower, they would sting in the shower. My nails snapped off. I had to wear plasters on them. And I was I was beating myself up over it, like, you know, Lou, you're such a twat. You should have just you should have just said, you know, mate, can you cool off my nails a bit? Um, but I didn't do that. And yeah, I just I kept, yeah, I, I get myself into these situations a lot. So, Lou, how do you think that's related? You started that off with, like, I'm not sure if this is related, but this thing happened to me. So you tell me how it's related. Why does your mind go there? Because my thing, the pain I was in was worth less than whether or not she thought she was doing a good job. Beautifully put. Right. And then what do you do to yourself? So like, that's true. But then what happens in the shower? What do you do to yourself? Every time you're in pain, what does your mind tell you? Why, why are you such a fucking idiot? Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. So like, this is kind of weird, Lou, but like you're setting up, you're playing a rigged game. And it's a game where Lou doesn't get to complain. And it's always Lou's fault. <laughs> yeah. How fun is that game to play? Um, uh, not, not, not fun, though. Yeah. Sounds quite shitty. Yeah. I'm thinking, but also giving you space to speak okay i okay i don't i don't quite know what to say i don't know either so can i think for a second yeah you can, yeah go ahead so now that we've potentially made this discovery now i'm like uh -huh. okay great now what that's what i'm thinking okay what do we do oh, with this okay. <laughs> right so let me let me just give you a second to try to figure out where we go from here Okay, okay, that's fine. What are you what are you thinking right now? 
Um, it's just a lot of sort of painful memories just just came back about tell me. about those girls and tell me, tell me, tell me. Um, so, oh, I just there was it's the same group of same group of girls. There was one time it was the first time that I'd ever. Oh, this is really embarrassing to say. It was the first time I'd ever been like naked in front of someone. We went to get a spray tan together. Um, I I was eighteen, and it was for it was for like the the, the prom at the at the end of like I, I guess it's what you would call it. It was called the Leavers Ball or something. Um, but we went to get a spray tan together. I didn't actually know you were supposed to like get naked for a spray tan so uh that was a surprise um but I did she had hers done and then I went to get mine done straight afterwards and then I went back into the changing room to put um my stuff back on my clothes back on and she <laughs> she said to me um what the fuck is wrong with your nipples <laughs> they look blue I don't, I mean, I don't think I have blue nipples, um, but she said that and then she said, um, when you have sex with a guy, don't take off your top because he's not going to want to fuck you. Um, and at the time, I was just trying my hardest not to look upset by this because I knew that she'd call me sensitive. So I was, I was just like, oh, okay, loved and like joked along, and and then when I got home, I I couldn't stop thinking about it, and it meant that for the rest of my relationships, so I I used to just keep my shirt on, yeah. Wow. What do you think about that story now? I think that my nipples aren't fucking blue. <laughs> uh, so there's there's something important there. I mean, there's a lot that's important there, but I, I just want to point something out to you. Yeah. You look like you're processing still. Yeah. I'm going to give you a second. You let me know when you're okay. ready. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> so if someone says something like that about you, yeah, there's a, there's like, if someone says something mean about you, there's like this counterpoint, right? There's like a, no, my nipples are normal or whatever. But the, the point is when someone puts you down, there's a voice within you that says, no, that isn't true. And what did you do to that voice? Squashed it. Yep. And so then what becomes true for you? What's left? What they, what they said to me. Yeah. And so if we think about it, like when we think about, or at the very beginning of this conversation, I sort of mentioned to you that like your mind generates these thoughts, Right. And like, where do those thoughts come from? They come from, like the mind generates thoughts that it thinks are true. But the truth, like the, the thought generating machines in your mind, I think were formed by experiences like this because they were allowed to become true. Certain opinions about you as a person stood unopposed. In fact, if anything, and be careful because I'm not blaming you for this because, but it could seem like an indictment. I could make it sound yeah. like it's your fault. So be careful, okay? Because watch out if the victim complex comes up. But you basically stabbed yourself in the back, right? Because instead of fighting against that thought, and I'm not saying that this is your fault. So be careful, victim complex, don't arise. But if it does arise, you let me know. But basically what happened is for a long time, it sounded like you have some real asshole people in your life that were laying the foundation of the way that you viewed yourself. And so, yeah. like, go ahead. Sorry. I I will say quite 
nasty things about myself hmm? to uh, to other people because then it hurts less hearing them. Mm -hmm. You own it, right? Yeah. Why do you call yourself Pooper Noodle again? Because cause I shot in a sink. And if you call yourself Pooper Noodle, what does that let you do? Um, I own it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it hurts less. Yeah. We're going to just sit quietly for a moment. <laughs> if you need me to say something, please let me know. Okay. I'm um, feeling emotions too. Okay. <laughs> I have tears welling up in my eyes. That's that's very nice of you. <laughs> um Okay. Yeah. What are you feeling right now? Um I don't, I don't know. I am um, there's there's something else that I do as well as say nasty things about myself. And I don't know how to explain this. I don't know why I do it. Um, but I will actively go out sometimes. If I'm, if I'm having a really good day, sometimes I will actively go out online, search my name and look for the really nasty comments about me. And I will, I will do it to myself. And I, I will look for the nasty things. I don't know if it's to like uh, prepare myself or I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I do that quite often. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Can I have a moment to figure out how to explain it? Yes, you can. I think it comes down to, well, hold on. I'm just going to toss out a random kind of story. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes people torture themselves on social media before they go to bed. It took me a while to like figure out why they do this, but I, I don't know how else to describe it. But like, you know, sometimes when it's like late at night and you may be feeling good about yourself, you may be feeling bad about yourself. But then what you do is you hop on social media and you look at all of the wonderful things that other people are doing and it just makes you feel like shit. But you just sign up for that torture. Like yeah. you log on and you gravitate towards seeing all of these happy people and each person that you see makes you feel worse and worse. But you just keep looking. And you know you do it to yourself. And you do it to yourself. And sometimes you're feeling good and sometimes you're feeling bad. Sometimes it's sort of like confirming what you already suspect and sometimes it's like knocking you down a peg because you don't deserve to feel good about yourself yeah and in your case i think hope is a dangerous thing because if, if hope yep i think hope is a dangerous thing because you've been at the bottom of the pecking order. You know you can survive that, right? Like, it's familiar territory. You know how to play this game. You've played this game before. You're actually really good at speedrunning this game. When Lou's at the bottom of the totem pole, you spend, you spend so much time knocking yourself down, you know exactly what it looks like. You can survive that. You're actually quite strong, and you know you're strong. You know if people think you're shit... You'll survive that because you've survived it for a long time. I was about to say your entire life, but that's not true. What's dangerous is if you're not at the bottom of the totem pole. Because being at the bottom, you're used to. Falling to the bottom, that hurts so much more. Yeah. It's the possibility that you may not be at the bottom, which is absolutely terrifying. What do you think about that? 
Um, I yeah, I, that's very well put. I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's related, but I was been told I'm quite a pushover um, mm -hmm. as, as well. Sure. Um, so, 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 so when I am, you know, assertive, it's it's a huge victory for me. Just a, just a small thing, like telling a taxi driver that my seatbelt is stuck in the door. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the 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 totem pole thing, I. Um, yeah, I don't. I. Yeah, sorry. I'm thinking and trying to speak at the same time. It's not working. <laughs> I fuck that up on the on a daily basis. <laughs> I should use your line. <laughs> um, it's a good one. <laughs> Um, no, it, right? normally, like, yeah, that normally doesn't... before, like, uh, doing something like this, I would, I would, I'll drink or like, like, cause in the past, like at a university and stuff, I've, I've always been really boring, sober. And then when I drink the next day, people would be like, oh, you, you're so much fun. When you drink, you should do more often. You should you know, come out. Oh, you, you were so funny last night. Um, so then I start to think that I'm like I can't be f funny without without alcohol. I don't drink very often because I don't socialize very often. Maybe like once a month. Um, but when I do, I drink excessively because I feel like I have to catch up to everyone else's social level of of being you know, a social person. Um, so, yeah. And then it always backfires because I can't tell you how many people that I've tried to make friends with at university, but um, I fucked it up the first night because they invited me out for drinks and then I drank too much and I they had to take me home from the club and I threw up in the taxi and then they never spoke to me again. Um, that's happened quite a lot. I ruin it for myself, really, with the alcohol um yeah You're quite good at ruining things for yourself yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> pro you know the one of the hardest things about substances so I, I don't know how many people know this but in my day job i'm actually an addiction psychiatrist so i work primarily with addictions oh you know you know what the hardest addiction is to crack it's when people tell me that when I use the substance, I feel the way that other people look. I feel normal. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's easy to give up something, but it's hard to give up that which makes you normal. It's a big ask. Yeah. That's what it is, right? You get to be normal. You get to be funny. You get to have people like you. You get to not think those things about yourself that sober you likes to think. Yeah. But then the next day I do. <laughs> Absolutely, right? So here's the mm -hmm. thing about drinking. It's a good point. You're not actually normal when you drink. You're just taking a loan. You're going to have to pay that back, right? Because all of the self-judgmental thoughts are going to come roaring back. And you're actually going to sabotage your relationships. But man, is it really sweet. Like, it's just like a loan. It's like when I get like a loan from a bank and I'm sitting on like $10,000 of cash, like, that's awesome. I get to buy whatever the fuck I want. You yeah. got to pay it back. I hadn't thought of it like that. Right. 
right? So then, and, and the thing is usually when it comes to substances, as I'm sure you've learned, you pay it back with interest because then those people don't call you again. In that situation, I think it's fair to say, I mean, so don't get me wrong, I want to be compassionate and empathetic. But if you hang out with people for the first time and you vomit in a taxi, like, I wouldn't expect those people to call you again. Right? You're kind of fucked up there. Like, can yeah. we be fair? Yeah. They had to pay fifty quid. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. I, I don't, I mean, I, I blame you for it and I forgive you for it because we're allowed to make mistakes, mm-hmm. right? That's part of life. But let's like be clear and like, it, it's a mistake. Yeah. Drinking too much, vomiting in a taxi and alienating people, generally speaking in the grand scheme of life is a mistake. Yeah. Now, when someone tells you that your nipples look strange and you laughing it off and believing that about yourself and being self-conscious, that's not a mistake. That really isn't fair for you to think about yourself. And and it's really mean that she said that. And I the same part of me that, you know, I guess holds you to the standard of making a mistake for vomiting in a taxi also says that you don't deserve that. Sure, like, you deserve the taxi vomit 50 quid. Fine. But, like, this, the rest of the stuff that you do to yourself, you don't deserve. You also don't deserve to believe, and I'm not blaming you for believing this, that you're not a delightful person without alcohol. Because you seem delightful to me. Are you drunk right now? No. Okay. No. Because that would really torpedo my argument real fast, wouldn't it? (laughs) 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 Just thought I'd check it. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh it's interesting that you keep using the word deserve. Um something uh some something happened to me last year. Um and I wrote about it online. And for the whole world to see. Um, And a lot of people said, uh, you know, how how did she not see the red flags? What fucking idiot. Um, Like, you know, she deserved this to happen to her sort of thing. And that. I, I, I do. I do um, sort of believe that. You do believe what? That um, I d- d- deserved this bad thing to happen to me because I was fucking stupid. Yeah. Can I think about that for a second? Yes. Do you mind if I, um, and I want you to think about this question before you answer it. Okay. Okay. Do you mind if I add some or ask you some just basic questions about context. Remember we talked about this? Yes. So are we going to offer more context or are we going to skip past the context? Whichever one you want to do. Um, I. Let's skip past. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that feel like the right move to you? Um, uh, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You feeling Sorry. good about that? We good? Yeah. You're judging yourself yeah. again? What's going yeah. on? Your face is changing. I see it. What are you doing? What are you telling yourself, <laughs> Lou? <laughs> uh, the, I'm going to think about this a lot later. That's okay. You're allowed to think about it. What else? You're doing that lip biting um, thing that you do when you're judging yourself. Uh, I, I feel bad that I didn't want to give context. Nope. And I'm worried that I made your show bad. 
by not doing that. There it is. Okay, so just notice what happened, right? So there come the thoughts again, and you believe them to be true. They're telling you they're true. You see that? They feel true to you. Yeah. Are they true? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. I'll take an I don't know. But just acknowledge that they feel true. That's totally cool. They feel true to you. Turns out I, I don't think you fucked anything up. That's my opinion. Okay. Okay. But um, maybe your mind sort of tells you, oh, he's just saying that. And he really <laughs> <Yeah>. oh, <laughs> <laughs> You got me. <laughs> it's almost like I do this for a living. <laughs> so, it, it, Lou, it's, it's totally fine, man. I think I think we can, you don't have to go into context. You're not like a weak person like, oh my God, she'd be so much stronger if she spoke out. Because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, uh, right? <laughs> it's, it's, you do you, man. So be careful because don't, there you, like, it, it's there again too. Because you have an impulse, which is like, this is what Lou wants to do. Lou's nipples aren't weird. And what do you do to that impulse? Right? So, so now I want you to really notice that that's just your reflex of devaluing the way that you feel. You're putting, you're knocking Lou down to the bottom of the totem pole for the sake of the show. If I don't give a fuck about the show, you certainly shouldn't give a fuck about the show. Oh, oh all right. Something changed. I, I don't know. I just thought that was quite funny. That's all. <laughs> Good. Right? So, so how did we do that? Like, how are you feeling right now? Uh, uh, exposed. Okay. And how does it feel to feel exposed? Um... I'm worrying about what's going to happen later. Okay. Okay. I think you're allowed to do that. But but what I'm hearing is something... Is, so, so let's just track through what happened through your mind, right? So I asked you, should we ask more context or uh, provide more context or not? And then yeah. you, you didn't want to, which is totally fine, right? Because I think yeah. it's actually not that important. We can get a lot out of this. Um, okay. Uh, and and then you started to judge yourself, and then you were thinking like this: per Lou is bad in the moment; she's fucking things up now. And then we sort of noticed that that you're like beating yourself up again, that you're devaluing yourself. Remember, the show is more important than your feelings. Like you did it again. Yeah, that same program. It's like a bot that's just like auto run stuff for you. And then we noticed yeah. it, and that, and now you started worrying about the future, which I think is a different bot. But it's not the same bot. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. You weren't like devaluing yourself. You were like just maybe now you're catastrophizing or something like that. Yeah. 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 But beating yourself up and devaluing yourself is not the same as catastrophizing. Agreed? Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, no. I forgot what I was going to say. It's okay. What I'm talking about is quite abstract and hard to hold on to. Yeah. I also get the yeah. sense that you're doing, I, by the way, you're doing really well. I think it's hard for people to learn so many different things that are new all at the same time and are able to keep up. Yeah, I feel like maybe like 20% of it is going in. That's fine. Um, yeah, I think it's probably closer to 80, but that's you doing it again. You see it? But, you're going to take 80 and you're going to turn it into 20 in your mind. Uh, yes. Do you see how, like, it's automatic, man? How do you notice it so well? I don't notice it at all. Yeah, well, I mean, now we're going to get to red flags. So the reason I notice it well are two reasons. One is I'm on the outside. Uh-huh. Right? The second thing is I practice. So you can learn to notice it too, because you can notice it if I point it out to you. So all you have to do is you have certain programming 
that has taught you to take opinions about yourself and knock them down. In the same way, you can start to program being able to notice opinions about yourself and recognize that these are not actually fair opinions. This is just your programming. You have internalized the opinions of that group of girls. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm bouncing around a lot. You can also internalize what I am telling you. It just takes practice. So you can learn how to know this too. It's a, it's a really you have to forgive me. I'm an academic. So when I sometimes I could say things simply and then instead I make them complicated and hard to understand. So, sorry. Um, it's the way uh, we feel good about ourselves because then we feel smarter than everyone else. <laughs> When we say something and the rest of the world doesn't understand, it just means we're brilliant and they're idiots. And then we're like, ha, ha, ha. When actually we're the ones who are stupid. Because if we're teachers, our job is to help people understand. Do and you think you, I'm understanding? I think you're understanding a lot more than you give yourself credit for. Okay. I'm not making it easy on you, by the way. No, this is, this is, this is great. This is very uh informative cool should we get back mm. to it okay yeah go on how are you feeling right now real quick uh oh what did i say that i felt exposed yeah so? yeah yeah i'm i'm worried about later um what um Uh, okay. Um, um, do, no, um, uh, do you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to skip past it. Um, See, look at last, what you just did. Yeah. What, what? Uh, last year, I, um, I was, uh, I was assaulted by someone, and um, I wrote about my experience online. And I had a lot of people reach out to me afterwards about it. Uh, people that I hoped I would never hear from again. For example, the, those, those girls from high school read um, Shit. My, my stuff and reached out to me exes that I hope I'd never speak to again reached out to me um it was it was it was weird it was really weird some guy that I went to school with who I only spoke to like maybe two times sent me a message on Facebook saying oh hey uh, I, I read your twit longer um if you ever need someone to talk to I'm here like I, I don't I mean I know these people they mean well um, but I think that's why I feel exposed right now because I'm I'm thinking about later, like what's what, going to happen. Like, yeah, like who's going to reach out to me and be like, "Hey, I saw I saw your, your interview. You know, hope hope you're doing okay. If you need someone to talk to, like, but there's people that I don't want to hear from. That's yeah, that sounds really ungrateful. Um, but oh no, I just did it again, didn't I? <laughs> ah, how did you learn how to do that? Because oh, you made a face. You went like... Mm. Well, I, I fucking faces all the time, Lou. Okay, it's true. Just a random pile of faces. <laughs> you really can't blame me for that or credit me for that. I think that's you learning. That's what learning okay. looks like. Cause I make okay. fucking I'm making a face right now. Like what what does this mean? No one knows. Yeah, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, that's <neither> what <laughs> I. My face is about as RNG as you can get. Okay, so let's let's try to put some I'm gonna try to organize our discussion a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Do you want okay. some time to think? Nope, I'm good. Do you want some oh, time to okay. think? No, I'm great. Okay. Yeah. 
So I, I see a fork in the road. We can either talk about like, you know, what you're experiencing now about like, what is it that makes you not want to hear from people? What is it that makes you worried about the consequences of this conversation? Or we can go back to this idea of not seeing the red flags, feeling stupid, feeling like you, on some level you may have deserved it. Which direction do you want to go down? Um, the, 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 the deserving one, actually. Okay. So let's start with red flags. Can I tell you a story? Yes. One of my favorite stories. So when I was an intern, I had just finished medical school and I was an intern. So like when you're an intern, I'm a psychiatrist, but when you're an intern, you do all kinds of like physical medicine. So I was working in the ICU and things like that, learning how to treat heart attacks and strokes and pneumonia and all that kind of stuff. So I one time had this patient that was an elderly woman who um, had pneumonia and like what happens is you start your shift at like seven in the morning and it ends at seven at night. So you're in the hospital for 12 hours. So you're in, in the hospital 12 hours a day, six days a week. So, um, you know, we're taking care of the woman and she starts to do a little bit worse. Uh, her breathing gets a little bit worse. Like, you know, she starts to have her white count, which is like the her cells that fight infection kind of jump up. A couple things are happening. We're kind of monitoring very closely throughout the day because she seems to be moving in the wrong direction. So then when shift change happens around 7 p.m., my, my colleague shows up at 6.30. And then I start telling my colleague about all the patients that they're going to have to watch overnight, including my patients. So you kind of tell them about all the patients. And so I tell her, tell them about this woman. I said, hey, you know, she's, we've been watching her. We're like, she may need to go to the ICU at some point. She's not doing as well. And then he kind of takes a look at her like data and stuff. And he's like listening to the story. And she's like, and he starts freaking out. He's like, dude, she needs to, like, she needed to be in the ICU hours ago. Like, look at this, man. Like, she's not breathing well. Her white count is up. She's like, 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 just look at her O2 levels, her oxygen levels. And he starts, like, freaking out. And then I start to feel, like, really, really bad because he's, like, as he's repeating this stuff back to me, like, it sort of, like, makes perfect sense because he's, like, listing the data that everything that I literally just told him. And when he, like, packages it and gives it back to me, I'm like, oh, shit, this lady needs to be in the ICU. And then and then he starts, like, really panicking, and then he kind of, like, riles me up. And then I feel terrible because I – and I kind of tell him that, you know, when you're an intern, you have two supervising doctors. So I kind of tell him, hey, like, you know, I, I talked it through with, like, the two supervising doctors, and, like, they felt like – we just talked about this lady, like, two hours ago. We went and saw her two hours ago. We decided that we didn't think ICU transfer was appropriate. And he's like, well, that's just idiotic. Like, she absolutely needs to be in the ICU. So he starts paging a bunch of people and, like, people show up and they, like, take her to the ICU and stuff. And, like, I feel like a complete dumbass. Because I'm like, how did I miss this? It's so obvious. And so then later I went to one of these, like, older doctors in the hospital, like, these super wise guy. You with me, by the way? Have I lost you? Yeah. Okay. No, no, I... And, and then I, I kind of tell him, like, one day after, like, we have this conference. And then at the end of the conference, I kind of tell him, hey, like, I think I kind of screwed up. And he's like this nice guy that you go to when you have problems. And I said, like, I don't know how I missed this. It happened right in front of my eyes. And then what the, the doctor said next blew my mind. And he says, well, that's why you didn't see it. And he's like, the hardest things to see are those that happen right in front of you. Right? When you're inside something, every step of the way, you don't see the big picture. You just see like one step at a time and you're stuck in it. And that's how you, you miss it. Like if you think about things like abusive relationships or grooming or stuff like that, each step of the way feels okay. It's when you zoom out that everyone's like, how can this person be so stupid? And like literally, if, you, if I put this in front of my eyes, like I can't see any. Right? The closer you are to something, the harder it is to notice. Even if we think about your thought process, when your thoughts, when you're the really fused in your mind, they feel true to you, and they're not opinions, they're facts. They're not thoughts, they're not emotions, they're not feelings, they're facts. You tell yourself, Lou just isn't that good of a person. It feels like a fact. When you gain distance from it, when you learn to see it from the outside, is when it becomes a red flag, when it becomes a problem, when it's no longer true. Yes. So the first thing is that 
Other people can see red flags from the outside, but like that's because they're from the outside. The hardest mistakes to see are the ones that we make, not the ones that other people make. I mean, take any fucking person on the street. They can tell you a thousand things that you're doing wrong. Ask them, what are they doing wrong? They've got no answers. So the first thing is, are you stupid? I don't think so. What do you think? Um, You're allowed to say yeah. yes. I, yeah, I, 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 do. I think I'm fucking stupid. What makes you feel like you're fucking stupid? You're allowed to believe that. Um, I, 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 well, if I feel stupid, like, like your, your story, I, 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 I missed a lot of see, seemingly quite obvious things but i i didn't want to to believe that this person was bad i i wanted to believe that they were a, a good person it was harder for me to believe that they were capable of doing something bad okay so what i <laughs> it's gonna sound silly lou that doesn't sound stupid to me let's just Listen to your words. I wanted to believe that this person was better than they were. That doesn't sound like idiocy. That sounds like faith in humanity. And maybe you can say that faith in humanity is stupid. But like literally, Lou, what makes me good at my job is believing exactly what you believe. Anytime someone walks into my office, I want to believe that they can be better than what they're suggesting. Yeah. I want to believe that you are worth more than you tell me you're worth. Does that make me stupid? I, I don't know. Are you stupid? I, I don't know. I'm Whether I'm stupid or not, I'm, I choose to believe it anyway. People can call me stupid for having faith that you have value as a human being. I know it sounds a weird sentence. But, you know, like, like I, I don't think... I don't think you wanting to believe that someone was better than what you what they could have been. I don't think that makes you stupid. I just don't. Or if it does, I think stupidity is a good quality. And I do think that, like I mentioned earlier, it's like you get lost in stuff because it's in front of your face. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests that, like, you know, victims of sexual violence... Like, it's not about IQ. It's about emotions, power dynamics, kind of like predatory behavior. Like, victims aren't stupid, they're victims. You know, I, I, it doesn't, I just don't accept that. I mean, you may be stupid, like maybe you're stupid, but that has nothing to do with you being a victim. It's just like, those are different things. What do you think? Um, I, I feel like I am uh, I feel like I'm not allowed to be happy because I, I mean I've had I've had people message me or say things before like you know this, this girl looks way too happy here she's obviously lying about about the whole thing so I feel like I'm not allowed to be happy because then um people won't uh, believe, believe me and you want and people to believe you more than I want to be happy That's interesting. So let's think about that for a second, right? So I thought that was very a very authentic representation. So what do you think about someone who wants to be believed more than they want to be happy? That that's stupid. 
probably. <laughs> I can see why you would make, come to that conclusion. I, 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 I think though. So what that tells me, Lou, is that I, I, I don't think it's stupid at all. I think that. Um, I, mean, I laughed because it's. I sort of walked into that one in terms of your response. Because, um, like, of course, like, wh why wouldn't people choose happiness? But I, I think it tells us a lot about you, right? So I think this goes back to, like, you being seen and accepted for what you are. And, and your entire life, you've been sort of, like, trying to be you, and people have been swatting you down. And now with something so important, you want them, you don't want to swat yourself down. Like you want people to believe you, like you want to say, like, you know, take your pick, like six donuts is not okay. You know, my, I was about to make a comment about your nipples, but that's just going to get taken out of context. <laughs> but like, you know, take whatever, whatever, uh, you know, context, like whatever story, like there have been lots of times where you've taken what you are on the inside and you've said, I defer to the rest of the world. What I am get second place compared to like what y'all think. But what I'm hearing you do is like put your foot down, draw your line in the sand and, and say, when it comes to this, I'm not going to compromise. And I need to be believed. And this did happen. And if happiness is the sacrifice that it takes to be like authentic and accepted, then so be it. Yeah. That doesn't sound stupid to me at all. What do you think? I feel um, I I put a lot of pressure on myself because I I worry that if that if I if I heal and I am happy and someone is like she looks way too happy to clout chase and whore clearly lied about the whole thing then what if they discredit other people's stories as well because because it seems like I am lying and then suddenly I, I think I'm catastrophizing sort of sure see there you did it again look at that <sighs> yeah what are you starting to do? You're gaining distance from your thoughts. Because you were like about to like you were boarding that train and the, it was like the seatbelt isn't on. It's starting to chug away. And you're like, hey, hey, hold on a second. Can you pull over? I need to put the seatbelt on. That's what you just did. Yeah. You just did it. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Interesting. What happened to that, that train of thoughts once you were like, oh, I'm catastrophizing again? I can't remember what I was talking about. It's there gone. you go. Pull the plug on it. So if anyone here is watching, <laughs> this is the way you pull the plug on anxiety. She's like, I can't even remember. Like, just imagine if I could give you a pill that would make you literally forget your anxieties because that's what we just saw happen. You literally forgot your anxiety. Like, that's what you can't even remember what you were talking about now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I just remembered. See, it takes work, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, good. Because the more you remember, the more you can practice forgetting. And when you get really good at forgetting, when you get really good at noticing, then you'll be in control. Keep going. You want to finish your thought? No. Okay. So if I if I notice these things, what happens? Like I notice it, and then and then what? Does it still happen? Yes. Except every time you notice it, you gain a little bit of control over it. Right. So if I yeah. notice my facial expressions, if I pay attention to them. I can control them, right? And if okay. I'm not aware of what I'm doing, then I don't control it. 
So awareness precedes control. If you've ever had dental work done and you've had your mouth numb, can't control anything in there because you can't feel it. You're not aware of it. You don't even know where your tongue is. And so once you become aware of something, then you can do something about it. Okay. Does that... How do I... How do I do that with social anxiety? Same way. It's just, it can be harder, right? So you're like, so I'm helping you do it and your mind is in a very aware state right now and you're going to be exhausted after this. I'm going to be exhausted too. Yeah, that, I am. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and. And, and then what happens is like, you're going to do it again and you're going to do it again. And you may have someone to help you. Like therapist may be a good idea in your case, if you don't have one already. Um, and then you're going to practice this. And then what's going to happen is like, maybe when it comes to, you know, but I, I think in social anxiety, it's the same. Like you're going to notice yourself catastrophizing. You're going to notice yourself like you're, you're like, someone's going to invite you over and then you're going to have that thought pop in your head. Oh, they don't actually want to see you. They just want your 20 quid. And then you're going to notice that thought. And you're going to be like, no, actually, that's not true. They do want to see me. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes the stakes can feel higher. And so it can be harder to overcome. There certainly is like level one, level two, level three, level four in terms of difficulty. But it's the same. Yeah. I, yeah so something happened like a couple of weeks ago where um i like um everyone at the moment is playing this game among us right and a couple of weeks ago uh i'm in all these lobbies and i tried to to join this this random one and there were the streamers in there who i i i thought i was friends with so i felt comfortable going in there i was only in it for like like maybe three three games um but I just I had this really embarrassing moment where I went into this this call and like in my head this was a disaster but in the call it I, I can imagine anyone in there probably doesn't remember this at all um but there was this one guy who, who was calling everyone by their names and then he was calling me by my color instead of my name kept calling me orange <laughs> instead of poop manoodle and it really upset me and um eventually I was like hey my name is poop noodle and then it like it was like, it was like a little bit of a lull it went a little bit quiet and then everyone just carried on um but after that I, I couldn't play again I just I closed I closed the game left the call I didn't want to make a scene I was like I gotta go uh and and then I I just I spent like the rest of the day just crying about it about about just getting called orange uh and it was it was pathetic yeah okay so I I'm guessing that the reason you brought that up is because we're going to use this as a case for understanding is that fair? Okay. Let's analyze yeah. it. Okay. Is that? That's what I'm seeing is the clearest relevance to me. Is that okay? Yes. I think it's a great example. I think it's a beautiful example. I think it ties together everything we've been talking about today. So what would you rather have than happiness? We were talking about this, right? Because you felt stupid because you wanted... I wanted, you wanted to be believed. Yeah, right? So this yeah. goes back to this idea that there's like two kinds of loos. There's the real loo, and then there's the loo that everyone else sees. There's a part of you that yearns to be seen and accepted. And you're willing to sacrifice that part for the most, most of the time. But there are some things that you're not willing to compromise on. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is yeah. like this is like the real you that's like fighting to say I don't have blue nipples. I am a good person. I'm worth more than six donuts and deodorant. You know, 
Yeah. I'm a cool person. Like it's not about popularity or anything like that, but like I'm a good person and I deserve to be seen. I deserve to be treated and judged for who I am as opposed to who people think I am. That's why that person isn't going to take orange from anyone. You're not going to You're not going to be orange. You want them to see who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's that same part of you. And it speaks up and says, Damn you, I'm Pooper Noodle, and I would like you to address me as such. <laughs> right? And then yeah. something really funny happens. Like, so when you do that and you stand up for yourself, mm -hmm. when you tell the driver to pull over because your seatbelt isn't on, then it runs very contrary to all of this programming. Which is like you've been telling yourself, you've practiced really, really hard, you've leveled up a lot in terms of devaluing yourself. But there's this part of you that's like, is trying to break through this like hard soil and like start to bloom, which is like who you really are. And then sometimes it, it pops its head up and then you enter this period of intense conflict because it runs against all of the programming that you've been doing, which is no, no, yeah. no. They get to call you whatever they want, Lou. Why are you inconveniencing them with your name? Yeah, yeah. How dare <laughs> you? How dare you yeah. inconvenience them? And so it's like, like there's a this part of you that wants to come up, and then there's this part of you, and then then you're crying all day because like then it like then you're just kind of conflicted. And that takes time to sort of work through, right? And that too comes with distance, with sort of taking taking a step back and recognizing what's going on. Recognizing that for a long time, this part of you that knocked yourself down also, I know this sounds really bizarre, also protected you. Because if you knock yourself down and you hurt yourself, no one can do, can outdo you. And if you're the one knocking yourself down, at least you're in control. And what you want more than anything else is control. Yeah. Stacked up pillows against the door and listening, what are you doing? You're trying to get control. You're trying to control the circumstances. So this is the hard thing about anxiety. You got to let go of control. You got to let people judge you. And it's terrifying. And yeah, some of I them care are... a lot about other people's yep. opinions. Like, uh, like, way too much. <laughs> so let me ask you a crazy question. What's harder? Knowing that everyone doesn't like you or not knowing if everyone doesn't like you? Not knowing. Right? Not, That's weird. Yeah. Anxiety is a strange beast in that way. You're looking for certainty. Even you'll take you'll take a certain bad thing over an uncertain bad thing. Yeah. Which is like, then how the fuck? Like, no wonder you feel the way that you do. Because it's like, I give you two choices. 100% chance of failure, 50% chance of failure. Which one do you pick? You pick the 100. Yeah. And then it's like, no wonder you're where you are. Yeah. But it takes courage to take the 50. People look at that and they say you're stupid for picking 100% chance of failure. No, they just don't understand that's not how psychology works. You're not stupid. It's that the other way to think about it is control versus not control. And are you stupid for picking control? Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't know what the answer was. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Okay. This this is what I get too abstract. <laughs> some people follow me, some people can't. It's not a big deal. It's more on me okay. than it is on you. Okay. But does that make sense where you, you sort of, at least when you beat yourself up, you control the pain? Yeah. And you can survive that. You're used to that. Yeah. So I think the orange story is a great one because I think it's sort of like, you know, you kind of fight against yourself and then like that thing comes roaring back. 
And so the next time, I would say the next time you stand up for yourself, be aware that the part of you that has made yourself a pushover so that other people will like you will be very upset. There's one part of you that's like, I'm going to let other people do whatever the fuck they want to me because then they'll like me. And then there's another part of you that's like, nah, because you were upset that everything went quiet. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I inconvenienced them. I'm sorry, lady who's doing my nails that you're putting me into physical pain. Did I inconvenience you by telling you that you're physically hurting me and my nails are bleeding? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. It's, um, that's exactly what goes on. Yep. And but if I'm, you uh, if you would have told her, then what would you do to yourself afterward? Uh, what do you think would have happened if you told her to stop? I'd I'd have been thinking about like how awkward it was that I had to tell her to to stop and then I'd be like analyzing her face like was she sad about it was she upset that she was doing her nails my nails badly I'm terrified of like a confrontation mm -hmm. um, and you'd be torturing so, yourself you yeah you see so anytime yeah. Lou tries to break out of the surface there comes anxiety it's like how dare you how dare you be a person Lou how dare you have feelings? How dare you have value? Yeah. Thoughts? Um, Questions? Uh, no. I, nothing's going on right now. Yep. At all. I think we're close to being done for the day. Okay. How does that feel to you? Um, I'm tired. Yep. I can I'm tell. I'm ready for bed. Yep. Yeah. Wait, do I look tired? There it is. <laughs> no, I, I, I can tell you that you're cognitively spent. Okay. I'm cognitively spent, too. How oh. do you feel about me saying that? Uh, bad. Yeah, see? That's okay. Is that not a bad thing? Do you no, normally get cognitively spent? Yes. Okay. I'm okay. out of mana. You're out of mana. We've yeah. been casting spells for a while. That doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us stupid. It just means we're out of mana. We've been doing this shit for like an hour and a half now. Oh, wow. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Straining your, well. your cognitive, straining your brain for an hour and a half is going to make you oom. Um. Yeah. Do you want to learn how yeah. to meditate? Um, oh, Okay. Well, then. What was that ooh? Um, I've, tr uh, I've tried to, to do it meditation before, um, but two things. I'm very lazy. And also, um, I, I find that it doesn't, maybe I've not been doing it for long enough, but it doesn't, it isn't quiet turn down my my thoughts i i'm terrified of being alone with them yeah okay i think that's reasonable can i think for a second yes I may need longer than a second. I may need a minute or two. Oh, okay. Do you, do you want to, do you, if you don't want to learn how to meditate, we don't have to do anything. 
first thing. Okay. Okay. What do you think? What's the, what's the second thing? Is if you do want to learn something, then I'll try to teach you something. I... I'm wondering if, if you're going to take the out for both of us, because I'm not sure what to teach you. But I'll figure something no, out. I have an idea. I... Oh, I, 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 I just, I, I think, I feel like I'm doing it wrong because it's supposed to help, isn't it? And it just makes things worse. Is, am I doing it? I thought maybe. If no, you you're, you're not doing it wrong. You're being taught the wrong kind of meditation. Okay. Okay. Right. It, it's kind of like if I walk into the shoe store and I put on a pair of shoes, that's my size. The problem isn't that my feet are, or like, let's say I put on a pair of shoes, it's too big. The problem isn't that my feet are too small, it's that the shoe isn't the right size, right? You have to do meditation that fits for your mind. So I'm just trying to think about, what have you tried? Do you, like, what kind of meditation doesn't help? Let's start there. Um, m mindfulness. Yep, mindfulness is going to be terrible for you. Oh. Like, mindfully eating and like looking at a little grape so let me oh, keep that fucking practice. <laughs> um so so let's let's think about why mindfulness is not gonna i mean we can do a mindfulness practice if you want but mindfulness tends to be sitting back and observing there are two kinds of meditation there's a focusing meditation and an observing meditation one is where you watch what your mind does and then the second is when you tell your mind to do something. So in your case, if you're feeling like pretty anxious, I think there are a couple of breathing techniques that could help you. But I sort of feel like breathing techniques isn't the right fit. Bizarrely, I want to teach you something like a mindfulness practice. But I want to teach you a very structured one. Okay. Even though I don't think it's really great for you. But we're going to try something because I think you actually have a talent for it in a particular way. Can we try okay. something a little bit unusual? Yeah. Okay. Um, I reserve the right for this to not work, and then I want to be able to try to teach you something else. Can we okay. do that? Okay. Yeah. I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Okay. So today, Lou, we've been talking about the different programs in your mind, right? So like, there's like the Lou that wants to come forward and like wants to be believed, wants to be seen, wants to be heard. And then there's the yeah. Lou that tries to swat her down. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I want you to watch carefully now. I'm going to make a statement. And yeah, I want you to... Eyes... Nope. Uh, close. How do I Pay watch? attention. Listen carefully. Oh. Okay. Good point. Like I said, I, I deserve to fuck this one up. I mean, I, I reserve the right to fuck this one up. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want you to listen carefully to what I say. And I want you to watch your mind and watch your mind's response. Okay. And just notice for a second, I'm just going to speak words, but that wor those words, they're just words. It's like, you know, my name is Red. I like balloons. Words are words. They have no meaning. Yeah. Okay. But I want you to see how the words that I speak are going to evoke responses in your mind. Okay. And tell me what the responses are. Okay. Ready? Yeah. You are a wonderful person. Do I, do I tell you? Yeah, tell me. What happens in your mind when I say that? Um, that the, the, just trying to be nice. That you are trying to be nice? What happens? Eyes closed. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, that, that whoever saying that is just trying to be nice to me. Okay, that, so, so you notice how your mind responded to that, right? Yeah. You swatted it down. Yeah. Okay. Now, number two, you are a terrible person. What does your mind do in response to that? Um, true. Okay. So that's kind of interesting, right? You see how your mind responds differentially to those statements? Yeah. So now what I want you to do is try to figure out where do those thoughts come from? Uh, 
Uh, You're not going to be able to. So just give me what you got. When I tell you to figure out where they come from, what happens? What? How can you look for where they come from? I don't know. They they just come from from me. Okay. So where from you? Good. Um. I I don't know. Okay. Good. Would it? Okay. So good. So you're doing it right. I know it sounds weird. So now I want you to think about, so when I say you're a wonderful person, try to find wonderfulness within you. Okay. Do you have wonderfulness anywhere in you? Um, yeah. Yeah. Where? Um... Uh... I really like dogs. Okay. And now, so so where do you feel that? Right? Is that a is it a thought or a feeling? First of all, uh, that's a feeling. And what does that feel like? Wonderful. Your, and where does it? Where do you? How how can you know that you're feeling wonderfulness? What is your experience of wonderful? Is, uh, is there a, a right answer? Sort of, not really. I've, I have no idea. Okay, good. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something else. Are you starting okay. to feel self-conscious? Yeah, because my eyes are closed. Good. Notice that self-consciousness. Where is that feeling? Where is that feeling? E everywhere. Good. <laughs> what does it feel like? Tell me. Um, like, like I'm, like I'm going to fall off a building or something. Yep. So, so it, th there's a sensation, right? Of like yeah. something terrible is about to happen. Notice yeah. the lack of safety with your eyes being closed. Yeah. It's like, what are people thinking? What is he doing? What's his face doing? Yeah. Oh my God. What do they think? I don't even know where the computer is. Am I sitting in the right place? Yeah. So you're. So notice that the, the all of those thoughts actually come from the feeling, not the other way around. Okay. I want you to notice the vulnerability is generating thoughts in your mind. Does that make sense? Okay. It's almost like yeah. a fountain that's just generating all these fucking random thoughts. Like, is my camera still on? Am I sitting in the right place? What are they thinking? What are they saying? Like, you see how it's like a, it's like a fountain. It's just spewing out these random ass thoughts. Yeah. Where, like, but somewhere there's a feeling within you. Notice that vulnerability. You may feel it somewhere in your body. What do you feel in your body? Um, um, but what can, can, can you, can you repeat? question yeah what do you feel in your body right now what does vulnerability feel like in your body uh i'm sweating okay good what else um pay attention to uh, your throat your chest heart stomach um i a bit dizzy okay so now i want you to in a moment i'm going to ask you to open your eyes yeah. but before i do that i want you to take a snapshot of the way take a screenshot of the way that you feel and then we're going to open your eyes and we're going to see how you feel afterward open okay what's happening oh my god that's so weird <laughs> where <laughs> what? am i <laughs> what's weird tell me I can see. <laughs> uh, everything's much smaller than I imagined it. Okay. So by smaller, you mean your fears, right? I mean the room. Okay. 
Cool. Things are smaller. Okay. Yeah. So, awesome. That means you're doing it right. So. Okay. What about your fears? That yeah, that too. So interesting. So now we're going to do it again. I know we're at both oom, um, but raid bosses at 10%. We're going to keep going. You ready? Okay, okay. Yeah. Close your eyes again. Okay. What comes up? Um, I can't see again. <laughs> there we go. Good. So notice that. You can't see again. So things are getting bigger. Yeah. Your fears are magnifying. The room is getting bigger. Yeah. And just notice that all of that stuff for a moment. Right? Notice how bad it feels. And now, open your eyes. And now what's happening? It's gone away. What's gone away? The, the scariness. Okay. So guess what you just learned how to do? Was, was that med meditation? Nope. Well, yeah, sure. You just learned the make the scariness go away meditation technique. That's oh, what we're going to okay. call it. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I want you to really pay attention. So you can try this. I think this is actually a good technique for you. So I want you to just, this is going to be your technique. I don't know that it's going to work for anyone else. But what I want you to notice, and you got to tell me if I'm wrong, okay? Lou, you can't, please just don't tell me what I want to hear. What okay. I want you to notice is that the size of your fears grows and shrinks. Depending on what? Your eyes being open or closed. Yeah. How That's vulnerable I am. fucking dumb. Your eyes being open and closed has nothing to do with the fears in the world. It has to do with your feelings. It has to do with your sense of vulnerability. But the fear is the fear. The fear, the actual probability that something bad happens is not going to change. It's not going to alter wildly in the span of 90 seconds, whether you're doing this or doing this. Does that make sense? Yeah. But how does it feel? It feels like the fears become bigger. Even the room becomes bigger. The microphone is like in your face. Right? Like, like yeah. everything is like pressing in on you. With your eyes closed. And so what you're doing is like the world is like coming in and then you open them and it zooms out. Everything feels smaller. Bigger, smaller. Bigger, smaller. And so if you do this practice, so you start by doing it by yourself. And then if there's someone that you trust, do it with them in the room and it's going to make it way harder. Okay. And then go and do it in a public place. Oh no. Right? But here's the, here's the crazy thing, Lou. Like stay with me now, okay? Try really hard. You with me? Do your best. Okay. <laughs> All you're doing is opening and closing your fucking eyes. The world doesn't change that rapidly. Do you see how your fears will literally grow or shrink depending whether on whether your eyes are open or closed? But what, what if I get hit by a car? Well, I mean, okay, so let's, worry, let's not worry about the public place yet. Let's just focus okay. on in the room and with one person you trust. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, what if you get hit by a car? I, I'm i not saying you do it while you're driving, okay? <laughs> I'm saying, like, like if you have a balcony, like, go out onto the balcony or something okay. like that. Okay. But what, what I really, I, I don't know if you're getting this or not, which is fine, because I know you're oom um and I'm out of oom. Um, so I'm asking a lot of you. But what I want you to notice is that literally your fears can grow or shrink depending on what your eyelids are doing. And do you see how, like, that's just not literally, like, how the world works? 
Like, my chances of getting hit by a car don't... In- well, maybe they do increase or decrease if my eyes are closed. But <laughs> bad example or a good example on your part. Real five-head play there. But generally speaking, you know, the, the fear or your value as a human being or all of these other things that you're worried about shouldn't change over the span of 60 seconds if you open or close your eyes. Does that make sense? Yeah. But the feeling changes rapidly. And so if you do this practice, literally what you're going to gain is control over your fear. You're going to learn the process of shrinking your fears or growing them. And you're going to see how the mind shrinks fears and grows them. Yeah. And as you learn that, you're going to get, literally, you're going to get control over your fear. Because you'll learn cognitively how to shrink it. It's like a shrink matic for your fears. I like that. <laughs> So, and even if what I'm saying to you right now doesn't make sense, that's okay. It doesn't need to make sense right now. Just do the practice. Do it a couple times a week. Just like go and like close your eyes. Just notice like it's like closing your eyes is like opening the doors to your fears. And then opening them is like putting them all away. Yeah. And yet it's still, you still have within you the capacity of putting them all away. Yeah. Questions. I really like that. No, that's that's that sounds much better than than what I was doing before. Um, yeah. 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 You. I think I'm glad it worked. I don't. I guess I don't have to come up with a backup then. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's good. That to work. No, because I just I didn't know because it's 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 actually like a high level meditation technique. It's not like a novice meditation technique. Oh, yeah. Does that make me uh, an expert in meditation? What does that thought evoke in you? If I were to tell you, Lou, you are an expert at meditation. <laughs> what happens? Um, I don't know. It'd be pretty cool. Could tell yes. The so the short answer is yes. Yeah. Let me explain it to you this way. You spend so much time in your head, so you're actually going to be pretty good at meditation. Oh, yeah. Right? Because from a very young age, when other people were interacting with the outside world, who were you interacting with? Me. So you started leveling up meditation very young. Oh. You've leveled up a skill, you just haven't found the right gear until today. Okay. Oh. And so practice it. Okay. Any closing thoughts or questions before we wrap up for the day? Um, um, how do I not care about what other people think of me? You do care about what other people think about you. You don't not care. You just let yourself care. Caring is fine. What I want you to learn, Lou, is not to not care what other people think. It's to gain distance from the caring. Okay. Right? You're allowed to care what other people think. But it doesn't have to control who you are. Okay. You're perfect the way you are. You don't need to change. You just need perspective on who you are. I know it's a weird concept. Okay. <laughs> Do you feel like Sorry, he's just, just saying that? Uh, I don't know. Just it was just quite nice, and yeah. Now I'm crying. I don't know why. <laughs> so that's pretty. So you know what's cool about that is I just called you perfect, and your mind didn't respond with he's just saying that. You were able to feel it. It was able to sink in. And I'm not saying it to be nice. I think it's genuinely true. I think you're amazing exactly how you are. And that your life has been a confluence of circumstances to make you into a perfect and unique human being. 
And that just because you have flaws doesn't mean that you aren't perfect. And that's part of life. It's part of the journey of growth. And I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Do the practice three times a week for two I, to three minutes, okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for okay. coming on, Lou. Thank, thank you so thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. Do I leave, do I leave now? Is that sure? Do I? Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, bye. Okay. Do goodbye. you want to just tell us about your channel before you go? Uh, no, no, God, no. Bye. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> okay. So I guess. Don't check her out. <laughs>